coming up, an armada of airplanes brings supplies to hurricane victims in Florida, more notable aviators speak out against ATC privatization, and a look back at our record-breaking fly-in to Norman, Oklahoma, and remembering the brave men and women of Flight 93 on September 11th. AOPA Live this week begins in just a moment. Build and fly with the Sonics Aircraft B models. The B models offer more room and comfort, more fuel, more panel space, more engine choices, and the same great Sonics Aircraft flight characteristics. Learn more at sonicsaircraft.com. This is AOPA Live This Week with Tom Haynes and Melissa Rudinger. We start this week with what's on everybody's mind, devastation in the Caribbean and the southeast U.S. from Hurricane Irma. It's been a double whammy, first Harvey in Texas and now both sides of Florida and up through Georgia and South Carolina. And just like what happened after Harvey, general aviation pilots have dropped everything to volunteer their aircraft to fly missions that can only be done with GA. Tom Haynes and several AOPA staffers and airplanes have joined the effort. Tom joins us now from Florida. So Tom, what are you doing and where are you? Well, Melissa, I'm at Summerlin Key, Middle Key, one of the most heavily damaged uh, parts of Florida. And uh, I've been busy this week along with a whole lot of other pilots and other volunteers, uh, getting a sense of what it is that general aviation can, can do in a situation like this to make a big difference. We landed in Lakeland where the Sun and Fun grounds became our base of operations. Aerobridge and Operation Airdrop were on scene helping to match up the needs on the ground with the capabilities of the volunteer pilots and aircraft. In Ocala, a semi full of medicine, water and other supplies was waiting for us. We're going to load these uh, four airplanes up with much uh, critically needed supplies and we're going to get these uh, four airplanes headed back south. We didn't make it to the Keys that first day, just back to Lakeland where volunteers from a local university were waiting to load up a trailer and get things moving farther down the line. Meanwhile, two rental trucks driven by AOPA staffers were headed to Florida. AOPA had put out a call for donations to the Frederick community, and they came rolling in to the National Aviation Community Center. By the second day, our mission was better defined. Stockpile needed supplies in Homestead, and then move them to the cutoff communities in the Florida Keys. First stop, Sugarloaf Key, where the local police officer said they really needed food. We had about a thousand pounds of food and needed items and easily got our aircraft into the narrow private strip. Then over to Summerlin Key, another private strip. Our first response that we dropped in uh, right when we got here, um, people started kind of coming out of the woodwork like it wasn't a city in the United States. And Peter Burwell flew his caravan down from Minnesota to help out. There was a guy in a pickup driving on this road right here that was handing out water and food and people were coming out, hey, do you have food, do you have food, do you have water? Um, and then that's when it kind of hit that these people haven't had any of this stuff for the last few days and, and really uh, highlighted the need for, for general aviation to start moving supplies in here. And move supplies he did. I'm probably just short of 10,000 pounds of food, water, get generators, gas, um, baby diapers, uh, hygiene, sanitary things. Um, we just keep dropping it in from, from all the donations from around the country. Mm -hmm. Back in Olmstead, our trucks picked up more donated supplies and later delivered them to the Keys after pushing through some official red tape. So if we can guarantee that you guys get insulin on your plane and we know within a few hours it's going to be in St. Croix, that's going to potentially save someone's life today. Okay, so. AOPA's CJ3 dispatched on a life-saving mission to St. Croix in the U.S. Virgin Islands. In addition to the insulin, more than $300,000 worth of antibiotics. The return flight evacuated stranded U.S. citizens. And the cycle repeats. Find a need that only GA aircraft can fill and go do it. So ironically, this small private airport, Summerlin Key, has become a, a center for relief efforts because the military and others have taken over the large public airports and basically shut off access to a lot of the re relief efforts from the civilian world. The General Aviation's had a real impact and kind of going in the nooks and crannies, making a difference here. And uh, Mark Baker has been here all week, kind of helping with that, but also trying to clean up his place. Well, using the, the couple private airports that do exist here right now, 
is an early relief and to uh, assess the damage. And we've been bringing people in and generators in and ice and water in as well. Um, the military seems to be doing a pretty good job in Marathon and Key West. But in the middle keys here where there's a lot of damage, uh, they're focusing their interests primarily in those two places, which makes sense. So general aviation is uh, standing up here. We've got everything from a couple of caravans to a Pilatus to Bonanzas and 182s bringing stuff in and out of this, uh, this airport and a couple of the others. So that's the story from Florida for now. Lots more to be done here. Plenty of opportunities for people to come down and participate, particularly uh, labor needed right now to help clean up. Thanks, Tom. Stay safe, and we'll talk to you a bit later in the show. And Hurricane Irma and Harvey caused the vote on ATC privatization to be delayed. In the meantime, the General Aviation Coalition continues to fight this bill, which would remove air traffic control from the FAA and turn it over to the airlines. The International Council of Air Shows released another video with respected aviators speaking out against privatization. This one features six former team leads for the U.S. Air Force Thunderbirds and U.S. Navy Blue Angels, including our executive director of the Air Safety Institute, Richard McSpadden. And we know firsthand that the air traffic control system in our country is the safest, the largest, the most diverse, and the most efficient in the world. We are concerned about recently proposed legislation that would turn America's air traffic control system to a private organization controlled by the airlines and their allies. This legislation will not reduce the vast majority of delays caused by bad weather and the airlines themselves. It will not enhance safety, reduce fares, or accelerate modernization. But it will add billions to our nation's budget deficit, negatively impact our national security, and needlessly complicate border protection. We need your help to stop this legislation that will damage our nation's economy and endanger a critical element of our national transportation infrastructure. Videos like this are essential in getting the word out about privatization. If you haven't yet, please call your representative at the number listed in the video and tell them to oppose HR 2997. And to get an idea of what privatization in the U.S. would look like, we talked to a pilot who frequently flies through privatized ATC, or ATM systems as they're called in Europe. Dr. Michael Erb is the vice president of IAOPA Europe. The most inefficient ATM systems in, in Europe are the privatized ones. Dr. Erb said privatized systems in Europe clearly tend to prioritize airlines while making it extremely difficult and costly for GA pilots. Tasks like filing an IFR flight plan in Germany are complicated and inefficient. So what does Dr. Erb think of the U.S. air traffic control system? Your FAA is the benchmark worldwide, and mm. why do you want to touch anything uh, which is absolutely okay? And a newly released report by the Government Accountability Office supports the idea that our current ATC system in the United States is performing well. The report says that next-gen technology has increased flight efficiency and saved airlines millions of dollars in fuel costs. Despite this report, the airlines are continuing to fight for privatization. And with all the controversy over ATC, Congress is running out of time to pass an FAA reauthorization bill. The current reauthorization expires at the end of this month, so it's likely that there will be an extension. Bloomberg is reporting that some House members are hoping for at least a six-month extension to stop any momentum gained towards passing ATC privatization. And a big win for seaplane pilots in California. Commodore Seaplane Base near San Francisco was at risk of getting shut down due to noise complaints from the residents. The residents complained to the County Planning Commission, but with support from AOPA and the local aviation community showed up in force at the meeting, and the Planning Commission decided to rule in favor of the seaplane base. They even eased the current restrictions at the base. Now let's go back to Florida and Tom Haynes. Tom, you just returned from another trip before heading down south. I did, and the contrast between last weekend and this weekend couldn't be more different. We had a great fly-in at Norman, Oklahoma with lots of volunteers and the great community support. Definitely one for the wind column. Blue skies, fair winds, and plenty of crimson and cream set the stage for a great event in Norman. The southern suburb of Oklahoma City is home to the University of Oklahoma, the OU Flight Department helping host, providing volunteers and airplanes for static display. And boy, did the Sooner State turn out. 
500 airplanes and a record-setting 7,500 people made a land run on Max Westheimer Airport. One of the best fly-ins that AOPA has hosted. We are so pleased to have them at Norman Westheimer. Attendees like Dale Williams had a chance to see some great airplanes on display, like this airplane's Cessna 182. It's been rebuilt for a customer, featuring an all-new interior and a 300 horsepower engine. There's a lot of other details that went into this airplane. They also saw the Zenith Stoll CH750 Super Duty. This new version of Zenith's tried and true home build comes in direct response to the basic med rules going into place. It features an increase in gross weight and a slim new unpanel display with a screen usually found in Tesla automobiles. You have so much visibility in the front now. You have no instrument panel. You can move that unpaneled over your position or over to your passenger or right in front of you. It's really nice. You have plenty of leg room. You don't have to worry about this panel in your way, a bar, bar going across. But the Stoll 750 Super Duty was right at home in Norman. The Texas Stoll Roundup team giving the crowd a demonstration of off-field capability that different airplanes have. Those who came are itching for more. I can't wait to, to go again. I'm ready for the next one, wherever it is. And a special thank you to all the AOPA Live This Week viewers who stopped by to say hello. We've got a lot more coverage from Norman on the AOPA website. Thanks, Tom, and we'll talk to you again towards the end of the show. Coming up after the break, a hot air balloon race across Europe, a haven for history buffs at our upcoming Groton, Connecticut fly-in, and a somber trip to honor the heroes of Flight 93. The smoke is on. He's giving everything that he's got. Oh, I love it! He's there! The Red Bull Air Race World Championship returns to Indianapolis Motor Speedway October 14th and 15th. Tickets now on sale. Welcome back. We're riding high from the record crowd in Norman right into the next fly-in. Join us in Groton, Connecticut on October 6th and 7th. We'll have another great afternoon, this time with a New England flavor. AOPA Live's Paul Harrop says there's a lot to see and do around Groton, especially if you're into history. September 6th, 1781. You're high on a cliff overlooking the river. Fort Griswold is a strong fort, but the British keep coming. After hours of grape shot, the Brits have won. Lieutenant Colonel William Ledyard is greeted by a British officer asking him, who commands this fort? I did, says Ledyard, but you do now, offering him the hilt of his sword in dignified surrender. The British officer takes the sword and slays Ledyard with his own weapon. The Battle of Groton Heights is over. You can walk in the footsteps of this revolutionary battle in the still dugout remains of Fort Griswold, a stone marking the spot where Ledyard fell. Groton is a town that has served America since before she was officially a country. The home to the U.S. submarine fleet. You can tour the USS Nautilus, the first nuclear-powered sub. And pay your respects to the brave lives lost on the submarine fleet in World War II at the National Submarine Memorial East where the conning tower of the USS Flasher stands as a reminder of the 3,600 shipmates who never returned. Groton is a beautiful city by the water that has stood to protect us from sea to shining sea. Paul Hira, AOPA Live. Thank you, Paul. Find out all the details on our website. We'd love to have you join us by the sea in a few short weeks. And across that sea, over in Europe, a pair of French pilots accomplished an amazing feat this week. Vincent Lays and Christophe Hover won the prestigious Gordon Bennett Cup gas balloon race. 21 teams from around the world competed in the race, which started in Switzerland. Whoever floats the longest wins. The winning team flew over 1,100 miles. And I can tell you as a balloonist, that's a long balloon flight. Do you want $500? If so, time is running out. The FAA's year-long $500 ADSB rebate program is in its final days. The last day to reserve a rebate is September 18th. So far, less than half of the 20,000 available rebates have been reserved. To find out to get how to get your money, visit the FAA's rebate website. Fires continue to burn across the West, especially in Montana. 
With the fires come TFRs for firefighting operations. If you're flying in the area, make sure to check your NOTAMs before you fly. You can find a list of all the TFRs and a map on the FAA's website. And one last time back down to Florida and Tom Haynes. Tom, I imagine that it's some experience participating with so many GA pilots in this relief effort. Any final thoughts? Well, it was a week of both exhilaration and frustration, I have to tell you. I guess you kind of have to go into a situation like this uh, with a bit of a, okay, we'll make this happen, whatever thrown our way. It was frustrating at times, waiting for information, hard to communicate, where are we gonna take supplies, what's really needed. But at other times when we knew we had the right supplies on board, we were taking to small airports like this one where there was really no other practical way to get in. The roads were closed and it uh, was very rewarding to be able to deliver supplies to people, really making a difference by general aviation. And, and really that's what airplanes are, are really good for. Uh, so I, I would do it again in a heartbeat. Thanks again, Tom. And thanks to you and all the pilots who've donated their time and aircraft to help out in the crisis. All right, we'll see you back in the studio, Hope, next week. And finally, this week commemorates 16 years since the terrorist attacks on September 11th changed aviation and the world. An incredible story from that day is the bravery of passengers and crew on United Airlines Flight 93 who fought to prevent the airplane from being used as a weapon, saving countless lives. There's now a beautiful memorial at the crash site in Pennsylvania honoring the passengers' bravery. AOPA Live's Josh Cochran has the story. This once ugly field in Pennsylvania, ugly because of the horrific events that happened here, is now a beautiful memorial. The real dichotomy between how gorgeous it is and, and the horrific thing that happened here. And um, I think that this place is just a really beautiful, beautiful testament to the people who really gave up their lives to save others. The memorial shows the timeline of the events that fateful September day. It starts with a black stone walkway representing the flight path with markers for the other flights on September 11th. Towering walls lead up to the visitor center. Mementos and timelines tell the stories of the everyday people who courageously fought against the terrorists that day. I was so moved by the one child's uh, remembrance in there. He was across from the White House and he said, thank you for saving my life. Outside the visitor center, onlookers can reflect on the overlook of the flight path and the final resting place of Flight 93. On the other side of the memorial, a long path leads to a wall with the passenger and crew names carved in stone. The crash site, opened only for passengers' families, is marked with a boulder. This phase of the memorial was finished in 2015, and the architecture from the visitor center to the wall of names illustrates the bravery of the men and women on Flight 93. If you look straight toward the wall of names. It looks like one solid piece. However, there's a gap in between each name to symbolize the individuality of each person. If you look sideways, there's almost an accordion effect to the wall, and that's because the passengers and crew join together at that last moment to try to assault the cockpit and regain control of the plane. Visitors here agree that the passengers and crew on Flight 93 are true heroes the hundreds of people that you know that would have perished if that plane would have hit the, the Capitol building or anywhere in, in DC really. Um, the courage that that took is just, I mean how can you really describe that? And they hope that the country as a whole will honor the lives lost on that day. Unity that came from this event, if we could somehow get that back, you know, in a country that seems to be as divided as I remember it right now, if we could find a way to, to come together again, I think that's the best way we could honor these people. You know, they, they, they didn't fight for us to be fighting. The Flight 93 Memorial is a worthwhile trip, especially for pilots. Cessna 182 pilot Joe DeAndre flew to Somerset County Airport about 10 miles from the site with family and friends. For our pilots, they appoint us what those guys had to go through. And when you see it, it really impacts you. Josh Cochran, AOPA Live. Looks like a beautiful tribute to the crew and passengers. The Park Service is continuing to add to the memorial. Just this week, they broke ground on a tower which will contain 40 wind chimes that will serve as an audible tribute to the victims. 
Well, that does it for us this week. Thank you for watching, and we hope to see you here again next Thursday for another AOPA Live This Week. Instruments for Professionals.